Hello, uh, welcome. welcome to my talk about Sprint, uh, a, an exciting journey I made when I translated a very old video game uh, from its machine language into JavaScript. Um, thank you, Roland, for inviting me. I'm, my name is Norbert Kehrer. I liked very much the way how Florian introduced himself, so I will follow this pattern, maybe. I've been programming now for 34 years, approximately, <laughs> and I've never got paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you will now see why. <laughs> okay. Um, what I would like to tell you about is a little fun project I made some time ago, based on another fun project before. Um, I had a look at a very old video game machine from the time when I was a kid. I played with that one also. It's called Sprint. It was made by the company Atari in the year 1976. And this video game was in the form of an arcade machine, looking like this. It's a big machine with a screen and with uh, two steering wheels where you can drive a car against others. Uh, the game itself has very limited hardware, as it is from 1976. And it has only black and white graphics on a, in a 2D way. But the game itself, you will recognize it when I show it then, had many sequels during the years up to now. Still has, there are many similar games like that on the market. And you will uh, immediately see why. This is what this game Sprint looks like. It's a very simple black and white car racing game where there are four cars. One of them is you, the white one. You have to drive your car around this track and avoid the other opponent cars and also these oil slicks in order to get as fast as possible round and round these tracks. That's all about Sprint. We spent a lot of money on that simple game and played it a lot. So in my talk, uh, I will tell you in about five sections or so uh, what I did with that game now. Um, and what you can also try and do, uh, you can do you can make a browser game of, out of that one, for example, and use JavaScript, uh, preferably, to do that. You can make that game also 3D. It cries almost for being 3D. Uh, then, normally, I would close the project and go on to the next game. But this particular game was really interesting because I got driven or got drawn into it to and tried to understand how they made the car AI how these opponent cars, you will see then, uh, are steered by the computer. Then I tried to extend the game uh, and make new levels, new racetracks for it, which gave, also, um, gave me also some very big challenges I would not have expected before. And all these methods uh, I would like to show you now a little bit and um, let's say hopefully inspire you to use them also for your own games or for other projects. Uh, I'll start um, and uh, tell you what I first did. I made a browser game out of Sprint. How I did such a thing, um, this was already uh, the topic of a talk I had here in this JavaScript meetup actually in June last year. So I will not repeat it now in detail, of course. To understand um, to how to make a, a JavaScript game, which is really one-to-one -one exactly the same as the original from 1976, we have to have a look at the 40-year-old hardware of the arcade machine. <clears throat> the hardware is a computer based on a very old CPU called 6502. That's the one in the middle. Uh, it's an 8-bit CPU with some registers and a simple instruction set. Uh, and for the game, it has only 128 bytes of RAM available. And uh, it has a program, ROM, read-only memory, where the program itself, the game program is stored. It has about 4K bytes and 12 racetracks are stored to play the game. In order to show something on the, on the screen, the CPU writes uh, what has to be shown to the on the screen in a screen RAM, kind of a video buffer, frame buffer, you would call it today. It's just a 32 times 28 uh, ca uh, character block, which is then drawn to the screen, to this black and white screen, by some special video circuitry they built into the arcade machine. Uh, when you want to translate this uh, to, to, bro to a browser game, the easiest thing is to go, you go there and write it from scratch. Do the same uh, as this game does, just from looking at it. But I liked, I liked to do another way. 
I took the program ROM, which is actually written in 6502 machine language of this old processor, and translated that with a compiler, with a self-written compiler, into JavaScript, into equivalent JavaScript code. So each machine instruction of the 6502 program got a JavaScript mm, equivalent. Um, and so you compile practically from a very low level language, which is normally the target of the compilation, back into a high level language, JavaScript, in order to make the browser uh, do the gaming then, uh, of course. The outcome is a JavaScript program, which does the same as the game program of, of 1976, it's equivalent. And instead of drawing to some RAM, of course, it draws in, it writes into an array. And this array is then uh, drawn by a simulation of the video hardware written in JavaScript, drawn in the browser canvas. That's all. So this, uh, what the outcome is of that, I'll show you now quickly. And so this is then the game. This is the, the starting screen, it goes around. It looks like in 1976, it's a very simple and primitive game. I'll try to play now, uh, yeah, if I succeed, one round. And so I'm the white car and have to avoid the other ones and try to get uh, to make this uh, this travel through. Oh, ah. <laughs> and I would I have to finish it because I want to show you something. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. So it's a very hard game. <laughs> But I just wanted to show you, once you've finished one round, you get a new racetrack and it goes on. So, yeah, the game, that's all. It's not more in that, that, that was the, the, the gaming experience from back then. Uh, so the first, it was really an interesting part to make this compiler. As I said, it's not, it's, there's not a time to, to talk about this now, but uh, you can try that yourself. It's really quite challenging. I didn't think so. But then when I finished that one, I did a similar thing with Asteroids, uh, another old video game I told last time. But with that game, I thought, well, it would be nice to make it 3D also. And actually, this is because it's such a racing game. You know, like Mario Kart or other games, they are 3D is from the point of view of the, of the, the player. So I said, OK. Uh, let's keep the original program from 1976. Don't change the game's logic, it's just, it's all the same. But the screen which is drawn in 3D, which is just drawing some pixels on the, on the canvas, uh, can be also interpreted differently by the JavaScript simulation. For example, these little dots of the, uh, of the, of the boundary of the track uh, can be seen as 3D cubes because you know in that game memory, in the current state of the game, actually running where, at which x, x and y positions, these are positioned. You also know in the memory where the, the cars themselves are positioned. So these are then, can be imagined as being 3D objects. And one of the cars, the, the player car, the white one, uh, the x and y coordinates of that one and the direction where it's actually heading gives you the camera position for seeing this world, which is now from a top view, from the point of view of the player himself in a 3D way. And if you feed all that, this co coordinates the 3D object descriptions into a library, JavaScript library like 3JS. It's a 3D library which draws just a, a scenery for you, which you describe on the screen. You get the same game in 3D. I'll show you that one too. So I made a little button here, click to print sprint in 3D, and it switches just to a different drawing routine of all this screen memory and, and, and objects, and then shows the game directly <laughs> in 3D. So the car, the car is driving around, it's, the graphic is not good, you need better designers than me, of course, to make it look like a modern game with a big Ferrari or something. And, uh, but that's what I, <laughs> I was able to do. Uh, so that's what it is. It's still the program from 1976, the game logic implemented there. Just instead of the video hardware, which draws it originally in 2D on the, on the screen, the same data are the input to the 3D scenery, which is then shown here 50 times per second. Okay, that's the second step I did with that. And that was also fun. So normally I'm done. 
But what is interesting in such an old game, when you program something, you say, yeah, it's quite easy. I will make that. It's quickly programmed. What is hard? What would you say? From my point of view, the hardest thing is, or the, the, the things I found most interesting is, how do the cars move, these opponent cars? They're automatically guided by the computer. Which kind of algorithm do they have to, to move in such a smooth way around the track? And this gave me some interesting insights. Normally, you would have to disassemble uh, to understand such a game. You disassemble it and have to understand the machine language, what these programmers did there. But in the case of that game, it was particularly easy because the company Atari patented this game. They gave a patent paper, patent application with the full description of the algorithm they used to make this, uh, this automatic car move. So it's a patented method from 1976. And the first figure in the patent application is that one. This is a car. This is such a track as you saw it in the game, level seven or something. And the little circles are the, the boundaries of the track, of the street. And here you have little, it's full covered with little arrows. And when we zoom in a little bit, these arrows are actually kind of direction vectors. They are instructions to the, to the automatically driven cars where to go when they pass over this field. And also described in this patent application is the algorithm which was based on that uh, structure. It's very simple. For each car, just have a look. Com the car has just now a direction which, in which it is going. Compare your current direction with the little vector on the cell where you are just going. Compare it with that. If it's not equal, then steer the car a little bit into that direction. Not completely that it now has the new direction because then it's rather, um, it's not very smooth, the movement, but just a little bit. And then in the, next, uh, in the next loop, check again. If it's still on the same cell, the car didn't move so fast, for example, that it got to the next arrow, then st steer it a little bit further into the direction of the arrow until you have it. And if it goes on to the next cell, well, then there is a new direction instruction. And that's all. That's like when you go in a car, you have a hole in the, in the bottom of your, uh, of your car, and you just look downwards, and on the street there are little arrows, and you just follow these arrows. You don't look out of the windows where the street is. So you just follow this simple algorithm, and all the intelligence is not in looking around and, and, try and following the street, but just looking down here and, make, and applying a very primitive algorithm. The intelligence lies in these vectors, in the little direction vectors covered all over the playing field. Yeah, you can read that also there. And then it's already very, uh, very nice and easier to understand the, 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 how the game is made up. And then you can do a lot of things with that knowledge. You could apply that algorithm, for example, for your own games or for other things. Once the patent, uh, is, is out of, um, which is not a case, I think after 30 years, you should be safe to use that also. Um, and, but I then tried to take this knowledge and design new racetracks for the, for the game, because I now knew uh -huh, how it worked. And the patent also describes in which way these, um, uh, these tracks are stored in the game ROM. So I tried to design new levels. Sprint itself contains 12 handcrafted levels by the Atari engineers. They made all these uh, track designs and made all these little arrows and put it there in a way that the cars move smoothly around. So I said, okay, that's fun. I want to make such a track also another one and inject it then into the, into the game program in order to run it with my own designed track. Uh, in designing such a new sprint level, um, you will see that it's quite a lot of work because first you start to design the race uh, track itself, how the, the street looks like, and then you have the, the big job to define all these little direction vectors. A lot of clicking and, 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 and designing, and then you try it out and maybe the cars don't move in that smooth way as you, 
as you thought, and you have to change them again and try again and always like that. And the worst thing, if you change the design of the track, yeah, many errors have to be drawn new in a new, um, and, uh, from, from, from the beginning more or less. So I said, isn't it possible that I just designed a track and let this arrow drawing do the computers? So that we have some automatic program which has given the racetrack and then computes all the little direction vectors, which turned out to be a quite hard task. A task which is known to the robotics people who also have this problem that they have some racetrack or some, uh, or some street or something and they have to drive a robot smoothly, nicely around that. And there in robotics, there is a method called potential field method, which can be applied to drive these robots. And it turned out that interestingly, you can use that method also to, the, to, to automatically calculate these vectors for the car here in Sprint. So let me show you quickly the rough concepts around these robotics method, potential field method. And then I'll show you the result. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we now need some concepts of mathematics, but please, uh, I'm also not a mathematician, so just the basics. Um, it's based on three important concepts, the so-called potential field, the vector field, and a gradient field. Let's start off with, the, with a simple uh, mathematical concept, a function. You will know it. A function is a, is a, const, is a, is a mapping rule which maps to each number another number. It's then to each value x, on the, which is on the x, um, x axis. It, it maps a new value y, computed by some uh, rule, or also just stored in a table, and then this is a function. Uh, and it can be drawn as a line or as a curve if you want to show it graphically. The mathematician, mathematicians like to generalize things, so they did this also with the function. They said, please don't limit, let's not limit ourselves to just one variable, to just one argument to the function. Let's make it two. What about if we have a function of two values, of two arguments? So we assign a value, a number, to a pair of two other numbers. That's very simple. Also, graphically, this can still also be shown uh, so that we have here in the base plane, it's then 3D, in a base plane where we have X and Y, to that X and Y we allocate a height, another number, Z, which is the height. It looks then like a surface. Such a surface in mathematics or also in physics is called field then. It's a function with two or more variables. Um, especially in this case, it's a so-called scalar field because for X combination of X and Y, there is one number only, a scalar. This field is also called potential field because it gives the potential like gravity or electro, electro, electric capacity. Uh, that's, a, uh, that's the term for it. Um, and then we can still generalize this further and say, well, let's not limit ourselves to the fact that we have only a number allocated to such a pair of other numbers. Let's allocate a vector, which again is a, are two numbers actually, uh, to each point in the xy plane. So it's then like that, that not a number is, uh, for each point in that xy plane there is not a number, which is drawn as a height, but a little arrow, a vector, is allocated to that. That's what in mathematics is called vector field. And if you look at that, you will recognize the similarity to these little arrow fields in, uh, in the sprint game. And I did that also. So, um, I have to show you another concept, the so-called gradient field. Sorry for that. <laughs> uh, we have here such a surface, which is a potential field. And it's like a hill. If you stand on a hill and you stand there, you can look around into each direction and have a look where it is going down steeply. Actually, maybe you can go around the hill, it's more or less not very steep, but if you look downwards, the most steepest direction where it goes down, this vector is then the gradient vector, the gradient at that point. And the gradient field is a vector field, 
which shows for such a potential field, such a surface, the direction for each point where it goes down most steeply, okay? So where a ball would roll if you leave it, if you put it there and let it go. It would roll down in the most steep way. And each, on each point of that field, this gradient field has a vector, which shows the direction of the steepest descent. So that's now all. These concepts are used in robotics in the potential field method to solve a problem, a, a classic problem. When you have a field where a robot can move, it's a movable robot like a car or an industry robot, the, ro the robot is at the point Q start here on the left top arrow, uh, area, and it has the goal to go to the target point. But there are obstacles hindering from going directly from A to B. So you have to find a way now to make a smooth path for the robot to avoid these obstacles and go from the start to the target, to the goal. And this is done in that way that there is such a potential field is constructed, a, fur, a surface, complex surface is found in such a way that it's like a landscape, like mountains, where the obstacles are, there are hills going up, and at the highest point, there is the robot's actual current position, and the target is at the lowest point. So if this would be a real surface or a real landscape, and you would put a ball there and just let it roll down, then the, 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 curving, the curved surface makes the ball roll in that strange way, avoiding these obstacles and going down. Seeing all that from top gives you the path of the robot. So uh, in robotics, you try to find such a potential field to, to drive the robot from the start to the target. So let's apply that now to our sprint game. If you look at that sprint game and you interpret it now as a gradient field, remember that the arrow, arrow then shows you where it goes downhill. Then you can see such a racetrack yeah, it goes downhill here, downhill, 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 and then the direction of, of the downhill going changes. It's then like that, it's curved, it's a curve, it, now this is the downhill direction. So this, these arrows describe, describe a, a field, a surface, and this surface looks like, more or less like a, I call it now a bobsled track, you know, from <laughs> the Olympics in Innsbruck or somewhere, um, it's like that. It's a curve, it's a curved surface like that. When you are in such a bobsled track and you put a bobsled there and let it go, it will go down all the curves until the, until the finish without anybody to intervene. So the intelligence is not in the bobsleigh, but it's in the curvature of this track, okay? And mathematically constructing such a bobsled surface makes you makes it possible to uh, to derive the vectors ahead for the sprint level this potential field then looks like that more or less it's as you see here here's the start of the level and if you put the ball here it would roll down and it would not go out of the target because at the side uh, it's curved up the the, the track it will roll down there it would roll this uh, this direction would then go down to the target, where is the, the end of the track, actually. Then it would jump here again and go on. Okay, can you somehow imagine how this uh, track would work? The all, all the algorithm is then just the same. If you are here, look where it goes down in the most steep way. That's the vector where I'm on. And just follow that, follow that vector. Okay? So the algorithm or the method you have to apply you have given obstacles, which is the racetrack, the boundary of, of your street. You have to calculate such a so-called harmonic potential field, these bobsled tracks. Then from that, you can derive the vectors where it goes down steepest for each point. And then the result is a vector field for such a sprint level. Okay? And that's then level one by the Atari engineers, as I showed it to you. I applied this method to that level. I threw away all the Atari designed arrows, just kept, kept the, the track itself, and applied this potential method, potential field method, <coughs> and it resulted in that one. 
it's similar. It's automatically, fully automatically generated. It's very similar. It's not identical because the cars tend to be more in the middle of the track. It's not so interesting, I would say, as the Atari engineers designed it uh, by hand, so to say. The, the cars try to keep in the middle. Let's demonstrate, let's, let me demonstrate you that also in the running program. Yeah, that's now, you will not notice a big difference. It's the same as before, but actually that's, uh, that's the same track, level one. It went through the oil. Yeah, it went through the oil. That's my, dis my arrow because I didn't put an obstacle there where this oil is, yeah? That's right. The, 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 the low one I did, you will see it will uh, evade it, but the other ones I, I forgot, I didn't do. But it would be possible, yeah. So that's all. it's very similar, but not the same. It's more, the cars are more in the middle, okay? Yeah, that's then the original game. And I then designed a new level by my own, very simple one. This one, this track, and also had uh, the computer calculate the little vectors for me, and the outcome was this field. I'll show you that one also. Very res resource intensive. Yeah, I'll come to that in a minute, and as the last point of my talk. Yeah. <laughs> Good question. Okay, so you see, this is a new level designed by me, the arrows designed by the computer, by this potential field method. And it's going round. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but, and have a look here, the white one is the fastest one. So that goes out. But what is nice, it, it, it falls out because it's too fast, but it quickly takes up again the right, the right way. So it's really flexible. Also, if you, if you just position a car anywhere on that board, it will try to go to find its way again to the middle of the street and go around the street. It's quite flexible. Actually, in the game, when you finish one level, on the fly, the, the, the track changes to the next level. And the cars are then in the middle of nowhere of a completely new level, and they have to find themselves the way again to make that rounds, and that's quite good. That's better than such just a pre-programmed spline or something or a fixed going round and round. This does it automatically with a surprisingly simple algorithm. Okay. So Sorry? and yes. What happens if it's too fast and goes outside the border? Yeah, they they built in if they leave the border, the cars for some reason then they automatically put them on the start of the track. That's built in the game, in the original game already, they maybe also made such mistakes and the car landed somewhere in the Nirvana, so to say, and then it, they just put it back on the, on the beginning of the track and, and let it go from there. So at the last point, the, um, oh. coming back to your question, the calculation behind that is not fast, but it's slow, because, <laughs> because at, least. at least it's slow, yeah. <laughs> uh, because there are quite complex mathematics behind it. If you read the papers about that potential field method, it's hard. So for me, it was very hard. A lot of mathematics, uh, deviations of such fields which you normally don't like very much. It's, it's really not easy, but that's the next surprise I had, and that's the last one, I promise. Uh, there is an unbelievable simple algorithm behind all that making such a surface, such a, just, such a harmonic potential field. You wouldn't believe it. It's really simple. It was uh, invented by two mathematicians, by Gauss and by Seidel, the Gauss-Seidel algorithm, Germans in the 19th century, long before the computer age. And it's really, really simple. I'll tell you later or in the, in the post then, uh, and break about that. It has one big disadvantage. It's an iterative, uh, iterative algorithm. So you apply it over and over again. And to get this field, you need a lot of iterations, which makes it slow. And I need it also. I made all that in JavaScript. Actually, and JavaScript, as you know, has 64-bit floating point numbers natively built in. And for my implementation, that was not exact enough. That depends on the complexity of the track, of course. It was not exact enough, so I needed a big number library you will find on the net or something, which makes arbitrary precision numbers possible. But this is also then slow. It's itself implemented in JavaScript, this library, and makes it again slower. So actually, with this old laptop, it took me about 30 seconds to compute one level. 
And for all the 12 levels, I did it, of course, then it was six minutes of program run to get these six <laughs> levels. So that's all I could get out of it. For a real-time car race, a car driving algorithm, think about it, because it's quite slow <laughs> until it, uh, it, uh, it uh, navigates. So on the last slide, what you can use this potential field method also, and uh, what it has already also been used, you can use that as it is intended to be for path planning for robots, like lawn mowers, which go around automatically over your lawn, like the vacuum cleaners. You have to define or have the sensors read the surroundings and then try to, to steer it in an intelligent way. It has been used for robot soccer. You maybe know these competitions where the students compete with their robots in soccer playing. You could use it for autonomous cars, at your own risk, of course. <laughs> and uh, you could, and that's what I will try again also, you could make your own games with moving opponents, use this simple, simple algorithm. You don't have to think about a very lot of splining or smooth movement. Take this simple algorithm and, and, and try to design such a vector field and, and you have a nice moving opponent. So that's all I wanted to tell you. Let me summarize. I showed you uh, how that you can make a browser sprint by translating the original code and get a, a browser game. I showed you to make it 3D by reinterpreting the screen memory. I told you about the patent on the vector fields for the car AI and the Atari machine. And I showed you some, something about automatic level generation based on the potential field method. That's all. I thank you very much for having, your, having me here. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so back in the day when this game was uh, developed, um, did they use that potential feed method? And if yes, how long did it take? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so, because the outcome was different. Uh, they didn't use it actually. That's what I found out. It's my little, my little. I didn't uh, invent a potential field method, but I, I think I, I found that it can be applied here. They didn't use it. They, they made it probably handcrafted, and there is one track which is actually not a round track, but it's an, like an eight. You, go, you yeah. go like an eight, and the potential field method doesn't make that eight, because it always tries to guide the car in the fastest possible way from the start to the target. So it cuts, uh, it cuts it off. It doesn't go the long way around. You would have to design it differently. So it was handcrafted, yeah. But I don't know how long it took them to draw that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to, to implement the potential field method. The implementation is extremely simple. As I said, it's really, really simple. It didn't take long, but it took me long to understand all that behind that and find this simple method, which they did, these people who write in robotics really describe in an extremely difficult way. <laughs> <laughs> That's for me at least, yeah. But it was then very simple, yeah. Fast. I don't know, one day or so. Not even, when I show you the code, you will be surprised. It's about one page. It's one loop with, with one page. So if I understood correctly, there's only one vector map per track. And it's yes. not changing during the race, of course. No. So basically, the, the direction where the cars is going is already decided at the start, right? That's right. So yeah. you wouldn't even need the vector track because you know where the cars are going. And you could tell the cars where to go, basically. That's right. Yes. You, so you could pre-calculate, you mean? from the beginning where they I should go. I guess there is yeah? no interaction between the cars. No, but that would be, in real robotics, in RoboSoccer or something, you need that. You need to recalculate dynamically this potential yeah. field. If it takes them 30 seconds, it's hard. Yeah. And <laughs> just another question. You yep. were saying that you were developing for more than 30 years, being unpaid. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And you are not coming out of the area of mathematics. <laughs> no. So I would be interested, what is your profession? <coughs> okay, if, I can. If, if you want to say it. No, of course, yeah, no, why not? I'm working in, in Linz. I'm actually from Upper Austria. I'm working in the company Borealis. It's a, a very big chemical company. Uh, we, have, we are doing uh, plastics and fertilizer production all over the world. And this year we had about 1 billion of, uh, of profit, which is a good, was our record year. It's running really well. It's a, it's a big group. Okay, I thought and this year was nothing to do because. So, yeah. <laughs> no, I'll tell you, I know the numbers so well because I'm there in finance. So <laughs> you need the vectors because when the track changes in the middle of the game and it changes the level, the cars need to find their way back on the track if they're somewhere 
So there are the arrows everywhere, even where the boundaries are. Mm -hmm. The arrows are everywhere, also on the boundaries. The boundary itself have implicitly such vectors uh, in them. I didn't draw it them, draw them here, but they are there. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I meant those when there is like a circle in the middle of the track. There are there in there are also arrows. So the tra the car gets pushed back onto the track. Yeah, even if it's somehow yeah, there. it's some if somehow caught somewhere, then it's got it's put back into the right uh, direction. Yeah. Do you think that would work in relationships as well? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great idea. Uh -huh. So you have opt, yeah. <laughs> I guess uh, on the, the game, the loop, the game loop and the render rings was probably determined by the old hardware back then. Mm -hmm. uh, when it translated to modern JavaScript, do you have uh, had to do any any adjustment for that, like uh, time outing or browser frame uh, adjustment or anything? Uh, yeah, actually, the original. You mean f f for the timing, for the correct timing? Yes. Or, yeah. Actually, when you make that game, when you translate that game to JavaScript, it's much faster on such a mod modern hardware than it would be on the original machine, and it's then way too fast. You, so you need to slow it down. The original machine had uh, a, a timer interrupt. It's called timer interrupt, where every uh, where 50 times a second, the CPU is interrupted, and it branches to some specific location, uh, to a specific program, which is done 50 times per second. It's like when you do in JavaScript a set interval, or as, uh, this, this routine is run constantly. And always, when I, when I hit that routine in, uh, in my code, I made then a jump out, and said, okay, now wait until, so normally the game is much faster running, but it then has to wait until 1 50th of a second since the last time has gone over, uh, has, has you passed. Set timeout or you use yeah. any? Okay. I use set timeout or in, in that way, yeah. So I wait. Because I've heard it's very, very unprecise for game Yeah, that's right. You are right. I also noticed that and you maybe also saw it. It's not, not great, yeah. So a good game developer for JavaScript would certainly do that much better than, than I did, yeah. That's, but you're right, it's, and it's, I didn't like the way it is. I would like to have a busy wait or something, but that's not, that's not good in JavaScript, in the browser. Mm -hmm. Maybe you, can port, you could port it to Unity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I never tried, I'm sorry, but yeah, why not, yeah. So every one of you can, the, the algorithm is really simple. It's really simple, it's not, not big rocket science behind that. Not the potential field method, I mean the game itself. It's a nice game, nice exercise. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching this talk. Down below, you can find our channel, VNHS, where you can find a lot of different videos about front end and back end JavaScript. And feel free to subscribe.